Order, order. The sitting is resumed. I now call Lisa Nandy. Um, thank you very much, Mr Crosby. And it's been almost five years since the coalition government took office, long beyond the time when it was even remotely credible to come claim that everything that has happened in this country was the last government's fault. The truth is, Mr Crosby, the choices that we make as a country have an impact, and this is a good time with a few months to go until a general election to assess the record, the impact of this government on the most vulnerable people in this country and to look again at the Prime Minister's claim of five years ago that he would not balance the books off the backs of the poorest. Mr Crosby, what a joke that statement now seems. The rise in food banks has been the most visible sign of the devastation caused to towns like mine in Wigan. In the last three months, the Brick, my local charity, has handed out over a thousand food parcels to families who can't afford to eat. And I wanted to say this, first of all, be in no doubt that this is a situation that has got so much worse under this government. Ministers have constantly said that food banks were the fault of the last government. But let me give them the facts. There were 3,000 food bank users in 2005, 40,000 by 2010. By 2012, this had exploded to 128,000 people queuing for food parcels in one of the wealthiest countries in the world. Food banks fed just tens of thousands of people a year under the last Labour government. They now feed a quarter of a million people in this country and the numbers are rising. Last year, of course I will. I will friend for giving way and congratulate her on uh, securing this speech, uh, this debate rather. Uh, she may not be aware, but in Oldham we never had a food bank um, until 2012. And in 2012, 849 food uh, parcels were delivered. Um, and in uh, last year, 5,000 people ended up receiving support, including 1,500 children. So in going up in inexorably. Uh, and the suffering that is being experienced by these people. I wonder if she'd like to comment it's on a, that. It's an experience Listen, that is mirrored in my constituency. The brick in Wigan last uh, year gave out 6,097 food parcels. And I spent a day helping them, volunteering to do that with their volunteers. Many of those food parcels were cold boxes. I'd never heard of a cold box before I spent the afternoon in my local food bank. For people who can't afford the gas and electricity that it would take to heat up some soup or a tin of beans. Our credit union, Unify, and the charities Compassion in Action and the CAB have all given out loans, furniture, and fuel payment vouchers in increasing numbers in the last four years. And yet they were told by the Conservative member for Blackpool North and Cleveleys that unfortunately their food bank use has become a habit. How utterly offensive, because the real causes of this are obvious. You can almost exactly tr track in my constituency when the cracks in the community started to show. In October 2012, the government brought in a new sanctions regime and nearly 6,000 families in my borough alone were affected. It had an immediate impact. The manager of the BRIC, Trish Green, said in early 2013, we've been operating since 2008, but recently we've seen more families, more young people, and people who've lost their jobs using the service. It affects every part of the borough and we distribute food parcels throughout different communities, not simply the most deprived areas. This is mirrored across the region, as my honourable friend said. The number of people accessing food banks in the northwest exploded between 2012 and 2014 by 238 and it wasn't, as the business minister and Conservative member for West Suffolk said, because more people know about them. The vast majority of those referrals were for benefit sanctions, although delays, debt, low-paid work, loss of job and family crisis were all common reasons. Most of my constituents, Mr Crosby, were referred to a food bank after being refused help by the job centre. A quarter of them told they hadn't participated in an employment programme, a fifth told they'd failed to attend an advisor interview. Let me give the minister an example of one of those families. Just yesterday, I had a man who got in touch with me who'd taken on temporary work over Christmas. He'd notified the job centre about the start and finish dates of that temporary work, but then he was told that he'd missed an appointment with the job centre 
to give this information that had already been provided, and he was sanctioned. The job centre was closed on the day that he was supposed to have attended an appointment. So he was paid just one pence for the whole of January, and he found yesterday that he's been given £26 for the whole of February. I wonder when the Minister responds to this debate whether she could tell me how somebody's meant to live on a penny a month in this country. Quite separately, two other people, Mr Crosby, got in touch with my office. One a woman, another a young man. Both of them sanctioned in the last few months for attending a funeral of a family member. In both cases, both of those individuals had notified the job centre of the reason that they couldn't turn up to sign on. I was thinking about this, what on earth people are supposed to do in this situation. It reminded me of a line from Kafka, it's not necessarily to accept everything as true, one must only accept it as necessary. When death isn't a good enough reason to change the rules, what sort of society have we become? Increasingly, we're finding that people are sanctioned for being just a few minutes late for appointments to sign on. Um, my local councillor, Jeanette Prescott, told me that several times this year I've had to refer a gentleman with learning difficulties to Denise, the local reverend, for food due to him having sanctions on him for turning up late once by four minutes. This gentleman can't tell the time and is a recluse. He's been found sitting in his flat in the dark with no electric or gas. He won't ask for help. Only for the old neighbours who watch out for him and contact myself. Heaven knows what would have happened to him. I was informed he has to get a letter off the doctor for an electric card. The lad turned up at my door the other night. He hadn't eaten for five days. He looked like he was dying. I'll give way. Giving way, of course. I hope she appreciates though, that those people who are working very hard, who might be earning very small amounts, who are you know literally working 50 hours a week, have to turn up to work on time. And if they're late for their employment, they might be sanctioned by their employer. Now, it's quite important that those people who are seeking employment learn the disciplines of, of timekeeping. It's a very important part of, of securing and keeping a job. I have to say to the honourable gentleman, first of all, that sort of patronising tone towards people is exactly why people across this country are so angry with this government. My honourable friend just made the point while he was sp speaking that two members of this chamber have just turned up minutes late for this debate but yet they will still be allowed to participate if they wish to do so and I have to say to him as well that I will come on to give an example of a couple who were working who got in touch with me recently who've had real real problems with this system but I would just pose to him and I'm happy to give way if he wants to come back on this what he would expect somebody who has learning difficulties who can't tell the time to do in that situation where he has nobody to turn to for help and where he is sanctioned for being four minutes late. Again, and I think that does emphasise the importance of the education system in solving the challenges we face as we move forward, frankly, in that you know, we, we've got to try and uh, make sure that the employees of the future are in the best place to take a career and move forward with a job. This, this, Lisa Nandy. This man is the fourth case of someone with learning disabilities that has been sanctioned that I have come across in my constituency office this month. And I would say this to the Minister, that she is the person in government who holds responsibility for people with disabilities. I hope she's listened to the comments by her colleague, the Honourable Member, and I hope she will take this opportunity to condemn those comments and to ensure that in the future nobody is sanctioned for having learning disabilities that prevent them from being able to tell the time. Yes. I'm grateful to my honourable friend uh, again. A couple of things. First of all, um, I'm sure you'd want to take the opportunity to, to mention that, for example, the U universal credit regulations include the uh, potential of introducing in-work conditionality to people who are in low pay and in work. So uh, I'd be very careful in, in terms of what uh, uh, the, the honourable gentleman is saying that. But also about people who have done nothing wrong. Rep repeatedly we are having examples of people who have, didn't know that they had appointments. Um, they're made without their knowledge uh, completely. And then, of course, they don't turn up and they're sanctioned. 
Absolutely. Lisa Nandy. I can agree with them more. And I just want the Minister to understand the complete nonsense of this system. Another of my local councillors, Lowell Hunt, got in touch with me to help a 53-year-old woman last week. She was awarded maximum points for ESA last year. She got no points at all this year. Absolutely nothing in her health or circumstances has changed. He says she's very little food in her cupboards. She's cancelling her direct debits this week for rent, gas, electric and phone. She simply cannot pay. It is the sheer tip of the iceberg when it comes to the stupidity of the sanctions re regime. The single biggest reason that my constituents were given for being sanctioned last year is because they were supposedly not seeking work. And take one of my families, uh, two, two, uh, a couple of two with two-year-old twins. One of the partners worked as a home care worker on a zero-hours contract. And I'm sure that all members will be familiar with the situation of many people working in the home care industry on low pay and insecure conditions. The hours that she was given were so small that the pay didn't even cover the bus fare to work. The wider family tried to help out, but the stepfather is out of work and the grandmother's on a small pension. They tried to take out a doorstep loan, but they were actually refused even that. Their two-year-old twins were living on a tin of beans and a few potatoes a day, and the adults were going for days on just tea and the occasional biscuit. There are members of my own family who remember this happening in our family just a few generations back. But that was generations ago, before the war. One of the parents told me asking for food was so humiliating, but the alternative was to go hungry. We were so grateful for the help of the brick, they made us feel like it's not something to be ashamed of. Contrast that, the actions of one of my local Christian charities, with Lord Freud, this government's Minister for Welfare Reform, who said free food banks were a free good, and by definition, there is an almost infinite demand for a free good. How utterly insulting to a family like that. Because they built up a thousand pounds in rent arrears because they weren't earning enough to even cover the bus fare to work. And one of my local charities at a loss as to how to help them said the only advice that they could give was for the partner to leave that job because it was pushing them further into debt. Reluctantly, they went to claim job seekers allowance. They were told that they'd left the job voluntarily and they were sanctioned for three months. The mother says we were receiving 15 minutes of work a day, that is around £1.10 a day. If this wasn't a good reason for leaving a job, I truly do not understand what is. Mr Crosby, this isn't an accident of the system, this is the system. The level of confusion within government is astonishing. This is from the DWP website. We expect claimants to do all they reasonably can to look for and move into paid work. If a claimant turns down a particular vacancy, including zero hours contract jobs, a sanction may be applied, but we will look into the circumstances of the case and consider whether they had good reason. But just a couple of weeks ago, I got this letter from the minister. It says it may be helpful to explain that job seekers allowance claimants are not required to apply, apply for a zero hours contract job and cannot be sanctioned for refusing to accept employment under a zero hours contract or for leaving such employment voluntarily. She even went to the trouble, Mr Crosby, of underlining some of the words in that sentence. So I wonder when she responds to this debate whether she could tell me how this fits with what happened to my constituents just recently. Can she tell us what the policy is? And perhaps she would like to tell it to people who are actually trying to navigate this system and as the Honourable Member said, actually trying to work within the system but finding there's no safety net at all. M yeah. Surely she has to accept that in a very complicated welfare system where you've got officers working in job centres, on occasion there will be a mistake that is made. Occasionally it may happen. Now, the, the, the question is how you put that, that problem right. And if the rules are being set by, by the, the government, and, and sadly on occasion they are being misinterpreted or misunderstood, then we've got to find a system that puts that right. And, but accidents will happen, and it's a question of how you put that right quickly. But as I said to the Honourable Member, Andy. it doesn't seem to be listening. The rules are the problem. They make no sense. I've just quoted to him two examples, one from the Minister and one from the Minister's departmental website, that contradict one another, and neither of which make any sense in relation to what happened 
happened to my constituent. And I've written back to the minister to ask what on earth is going on. I haven't had a reply yet. I hope I will get a reply. And I hope more than that, that all of the people stuck in the same situation as my constituents who just went through this will be able to get a reply at all. You know, there's a, there's a part in the trial by Kafka where it... Kay, the hero of that novel, says, I'm not guilty, he says, there's been a mistake. How is it even possible for someone to be guilty? That's true, said the priest, but that's how the guilty speak. That is exactly what is happening to people in this system. There is nowhere to turn. There is no way to fight the way out of the system. And this isn't an accident of the system. This is the system. And it's time this government did something about it. Because the saga for this family continued. That wasn't the end of it. After the sanctions were lifted, they were told they had to sign on every day at an unpredictable time. For a family with two-year-old twins, once, once, she says, my partner had to take our two sick, contagious children who were suffering from hand, foot and mouth disease with her to a job centre appointment. As the advisor said, you must come in, bring them on the bus with you. Even when we replied, but they have a temperature of over 40 degrees, his response was, if you don't come in, we'll have to issue a further suspension. We live in fear, she said, that our money will be stopped and this hell will never end. This is a hell, Mr Crosby. Of course. I thank the Honourable Lady um, for giving way and I have uh, great sympathy for some of the individual cases that uh, she's talked about. But I would like to introduce a note of perspective into the situation. Based on my own constituency experience, the last time I checked just before Christmas with my job centre, fewer than 5% of all the people they see had been sanctioned over the previous 12 months. So I think what we're talking about is a minority, and what the Honourable Lady is talking about is a very, very tiny minority of an already small minority. And I think that I would like to put in a word for san the sanctions regime in that um, it really has, in, in the experience I've seen, uh, been of a, the threat of sanctions has been of assistance in galvanising people to maintain their appointments and genuinely seek work. I mean, I'm, I'm very grateful to her for, for trying to bring some, some, uh, some statistics to this, but it just doesn't reflect the reality. Across the country, Glasgow University have found that one in five have been sanctioned, 6,000 families in my borough alone. And just in the last few weeks, we've had research from Oxford University that shows that the majority of people who have been kicked off benefits by sanctions have not gone into work. So it's quite simply not true to say that this is just a minority. And I'd also say this to her, and I say it to her with the greatest of respect because I know that she fights for people against injustice and I've seen her do that on behalf of her own constituents, that if this is happening to families, it must be stopped. We should not tolerate this happening to families who are trying to find work, who are trying to do their best, who have two-year-old twins who are ill, who are being dragged across town because of the inflexibility and inhumanity that we've somehow managed to build into the system. It is a hell, Mr Crosby, of low-paid jobs, zero-hours contracts, rising living costs, and a system that, frankly, lacks any compassion or understanding. And I wonder if the Minister can comprehend the social isolation this is causing. A mum of 39 who got in touch with me, struggling to walk because of spina bifida that's deteriorated in recent years. She's got three kids. She applied for PIP, but she was told, and this is common, that it could take a year. She said, we don't leave the house and I need help. A local reverend contacted me about a parishioner who was sanctioned. She said he was living on one bowl of porridge a day and glasses of water to stave off the hunger. He sold his TV and most of his valuables. He's a very gentle man. He cannot understand how this has happened to him. I was contacted by a woman who took a cleaning job for 25 hours a week in Warrington. It meant two buses, a train journey, and a four-mile bike ride just to get to work. It was minimum wage, and the travel alone came to £45 a week. When they found that money was missing from their first pay packet, which I have to say is a common experience for many of my family, families who work in that industry, she was hit with rent arrears and threatened with eviction. She said, we've only got three pounds a week after our bills are paid. It means we can't afford any shopping or gas once again. Um, Mr. Crosby, people are trying. 
but their government quite simply isn't on their side. When they ask for help, they're sanctioned. Nothing is done to stamp out the scourge of exploitative zero-hours contracts. We've got no action on low pay. The Minister's own department accounts for more than half of the directly employed or contracted government workers that earn less than £7.65 an hour. What could be more symbolic of the fact that the Minister's own department has one of the worst records in Whitehall for paying the living wage? This is a crisis, Mr Crosby, of the government's own making. And we know what the real problems are. The real problems are the lack of good, sustainable jobs that command decent pay. But because the government has absolutely no answers to this problem, they hit people the hardest that instead of tackling underemployment they hit the underemployed instead of tackling low pay they hit the low paid they pick off those people who are least able to complain and while they do it they hemorrhage money on contracts to the private sector that do little to get people into work but create the living hell that my constituents have written to me about and i'll say this mr crosby that we are storing up so many problems for the future this is pushing more and more people in my community into debt and one of the biggest causes of that debt is the bedroom tax Four and a half thousand households in my constituency alone. Rent arrears have gone through the roof and the vast majority of those rent arrears are caused by one factor and one factor only and that is this callous ineffective policy. These are families that have never been in debt before in their lives and they're not the same households. This is affecting more and more people as their circumstances change. 817 new families in my borough last year and there is quite simply nowhere to move to. In towns like Wigan we built family-sized properties on purpose because that's what people wanted and needed and that's what we did and then we moved them into those properties and then we hit them with the bedroom tax and we told them to move but there is quite simply nowhere to move to and many of those families have survived the last few years over 3,000 of them in my constituency through, um, by claiming discretionary housing payments over the last few years Quite simply, Mr Crosby, it's senseless. We're burning money. We spent 412000 on this last year alone. So what does the government do? Instead of reversing this cruel, vicious policy that is ripping people out of their communities and pushing people into debt, they announced on Friday that they're slashing the payments to, for discretionary housing pa payments by a quarter. The additional money for discretionary housing payments, Mr Crosby, when it was announced with large fanfare not that long ago, was aimed at disabled people and foster carers. So I would be really interested to hear from the Minister what assessment she's done of the impact of this on the 14,000 children waiting for a foster home, what assessment she's done of the potential impact on this on people with disabilities. You know, it is senseless. It doesn't work. The DWP's own analysis showed that between May and December 2013, just 22,000 of the half a million households affected by the bedroom tax had downsized, and it hasn't done anything to reduce private sector rents. The DWP's figures show that rents have gone down by 76p a week, but the rent shortfall is over £6. It doesn't hit landlords. It hits tenants. 89% of the cuts to housing benefit have hit tenants, just 11% have hit landlords. And what's worse, on top of this, many families, 12,000 of them in Wigan, who didn't have to pay council tax before, now do. And as a result, arrears have gone up in my borough by 91%. And just last week, to give you an illustration of the human cost of this, my office were on the phone trying to stop bailiffs entering the home of an elderly couple who were desperately frightened and had got into difficulties with their rents. You know, the impact of this can be seen right across my high street, where we used to have shops and charity shops, small cafes, small businesses. What we've got now are loan sharks, people who lend at extortionate rates to people who are too desperate to go anywhere else. Loan sharks used to be seen as a blight on our society, but now it seems the government is their best agent, stimulating demands, creating business. The signs of it are so visible. And let me tell the Minister about the reality. Not, as Baroness Jenkins said, that poor people don't know how to cook, 
but that poor people can't afford the gas or electricity to cook. Many of my poorest constituents are on prepayment meters. They get charged more. They get cut off, even if they've got young kids. Once they get their benefits back, they have to repay the debt before they can get the meter back on. My local reverend said one family we found had no gas or electricity over the Christmas period. I put £20 on their gas card and they got only £8 of gas because it took the rest in fines and arrears. For giving way again, I just wanted to put on record that um, the quote that she attributed to Baroness Jenkin um, was in, said in the context, um, and Jenkin said that um, as a comment on society as a whole, she felt she, she felt that cooking skills um, had been lost from one generation to the next, and that was the context in which she made that remark. And as, as the honourable lady may know, Baroness Jenkin does a huge amount of work in the area of poverty reduction. Yeah, I have to say, uh, you know, the, at the very least, at least Baroness Jenkin took an interest in this issue, which is more than I can say for the Prime Minister or most of the front bench colleagues. But the point that I would make to the Honourable Lady is it comes in the context of a stream of remarks made by different members of government and backbenchers of her own party that are hugely offensive to people who are stuck in this position and who are trying their best and find that the government isn't doing the same. You know, one of my local schools in the same area as this family live who had the £20 put on their gas card, which was immediately eaten up by debt. One of the local schools, the head teacher got in touch with me to say that they're now having to use the pupil premium to employ learning mentors, not to support children in the classroom, but to go to families' houses and try and sort out problems with vermin, with lack of electricity, with all the things that families aren't able to deal with themselves, to find them food and refer them to food banks. Last year, the Education Secretary said these are the families that are not best able to manage their finances but I'll say to her it beggars belief he is the government minister responsible for child welfare the fact that he even thinks that these families have finances to manage absolutely beggars belief and the reality is that children and young people have been amongst the hardest hit in this country Bernardo's got in touch with me when they saw I had this debate to say that increasingly they see numbers of families in their projects who are reliant on food banks because their income isn't keeping pace with the cost of living what a waste this is I know Bernardo's as an organization really well I used to work for the children's society and I work very very closely with some of the things that they did with young people across the country that organization unlocked the talent of children and young people. It helps them to, to develop, to thrive, to use their energies and passion and commitment in their local communities. And instead, in 2015, in one of the wealthiest countries in the world, they are diverting their resources to quite simply just feeding and clothing our children. They told me that there was a particular impact of the sanctions regime on young people, especially care leavers, young homeless teenagers, teenage parents, arguably those young people that as a society we owe the biggest responsibility to, especially young people leaving care. We are their corporate parent. We hold responsibility for them. Homeless Link told me that 58% of those young people seeking help for sanctions have got a mental health or other problem. 42% of all sanctions nationally relating to JSA affect 18 to 24 year olds. That's over a thousand young people in my town. This is a generation whose wages have fallen by 10% since this government came to power. They've lost the EMA, they lost the Future Jobs Fund, they've seen tuition fees hiked up to £9,000 a year and a record million of them out of work and their Prime Minister has the nerve to tell them that they should be earning or learning or lose their benefits. How is my question, Mr Crosby? Bernardo's told me about a young mum who was sanctioned for six weeks because she was attending a school appointment about a child's behaviour. They said after she turned to a loan shark, her children, desperate to help, went shoplifting to feed the family. Do ministers have any idea of the desperation that these policies are causing. One of my local police officers said to me, we used to find kids nicking stuff to sell, but nowadays it's more likely to be bread. Police forces in Lancaster, Cleveland, Northumbria, and in my own area of Greater Manchester, have said that food and grocery thefts are on the rise, and the local Chamber of Commerce said this crisis has been caused by excessive debt. To echo the words of UNICEF, Mr Crosby, it's no accident. It's possible to make better choices 
than we've made. Under the last government, child poverty fell by 1.1 million. And I know that because I was working with children and young people in the voluntary sector at the time. It also fell, as ministers are fond of telling us, by 300,000 in the first year of this government. But please, let's not pretend that we don't understand that these figures lag two years behind government actions. There's no longer any twisting the facts. Child poverty is widely predicted to rise by 2020, whether you use an absolute or a relative measure. So it doesn't matter if this government has made all of us poorer, because poverty is still on the rise. And the latest estimates are a rise of half a million children in relative poverty under this government, 800,000 more in absolute poverty. None of these figures take into account the rise in housing costs. It's not just the lack of material means itself. It's the gnawing anxiety that goes with waking up every day, not having enough food to eat, not knowing what's going to happen to you, not knowing what the future holds. If government policy doesn't change course, the IFS says child poverty will have doubled between 2010 and 2020. Uh, yeah, but I'll, be, I'll just make this point before I do, that the Benefit Up Rating Act alone could push 200,000 more children into poverty. For giving way, and I, I very much do appreciate the fact, uh, the, the, the list of anecdotes she's given, and the, and the people that are falling upon really hard times, and there is a need for government to act in certain ways. However, surely she must understand there is some responsibility that lays at the door of the last government, because the last government was the government that caused a 7% drop in GDP, a massive deficit that this government is trying to correct, and unfortunately. Unfortunately, because of the mistakes of the last government, um, you know, decisions, tough decisions have to be taken. And I've yet to hear anything from her about how um, more money can be made available from a sort of tree, magic money tree somewhere um, that allows us to make these sorts of, uh, of, of uh, that allows us to not make um, the decisions that she, or allows her to make the, the, reverse the decisions that this government has taken. I mean, I'd have to say to Lisa you that, that would carry more weight, perhaps, <coughs> if this government had managed to do anything like balance the books in the last few years. But the economic stupidity of this sort of policy is absolutely clear. You know, in constituencies like mine, you take money out of the pockets of the poorest. They don't spend in local shops and businesses. And we've seen exactly what happens when you do that. It means that shops and businesses lose trade, they then lose staff, and this vicious cycle continues. And I'll say this to him as well. It sounds to me like he's just offered the best possible defense of trying to balance the books off the backs of the poorest. But there is an alternative. Germany, Poland, Canada, and Australia have all seen child poverty fall in the last four years. The UK is at one of only four countries where there's been an unprecedented increase in material deprivation amongst children. The truth is, Mr. Crosby, these are political choices. And I would just say to him as well, you know, we were all present when the, the budget was passed in 2012 that it started to have such devastating effects in communities like mine. That budget that slashed tax credits and benefits for people in and out of work in real terms, some of the poorest people in the country, also handed a tax cut worth nearly £2,000 a week to people who earn over a million pounds a year. These are political choices, and to pretend otherwise is to deny the facts. And I thank the Honourable Lady for giving away a, a second time. Um, I guess there is always going to be a difference in politics between the two sides of this debate. I think that 1% of people paying 30% of income tax is actually quite a good deal for 99% of people. Um, however, take that to one side. What alternative is she offering? How is she going to pay for any of these reverses in policy that she, uh, that she is asking for? Um, there is, there's just been nothing there at all. Every time the opposition finds a pot of money, um, an imaginary pot of money, where, whether it be um, s stopping tax avoidance uh, in, in some scheme or whatever, they spend it 12 or 13 times. 
So give us some, just one single thing that they, they, you will be able to, uh, where you'll find the money to spend on these schemes, please. Yeah. Lisa Nandy. Um, so I won't give him one, I'll give him several. First of all, put money back into the pockets of the poorest because they will spend that money and the economy will grow. That means stamping out things like zero-hours contracts uh, that exploit people in the way that I've described by my constituents. It means raising the minimum wage. It means giving people greater security in their homes, jobs that pay the rent, jobs that cover travel costs. And I would say to him, I would say to him, that that isn't money out, and I'll come on to explain this to him, because he obviously does need to understand this and, and doesn't at present. But what I would say to him is that in this country, we are quite unique in having major structural problems in our economy that mean that poverty is higher than in most other countries before you even take into account tax and spending decisions. And it is this government's failure, first of all, not to tackle those root causes like low pay, and zero hours contracts that causes that level of poverty to be so high in the first place. And secondly then, because we then need to spend so much money on, uh, on income transfers in order to compensate for that by making unfair decisions that benefit richer people at the expense of poorer people, which means that um, that, that that problem is compounded. And that's why we've had the explosion in food banks in recent years, and that's why 30 years after the miners' strike in my constituency, where the community had to come together to feed and clothe our children, 30 years later, Again, because of this government, we're having to do it once more. And I'll tell, I'll tell him this as well, that it's not just um, that this is causing people distress and anguish and despair. It's that it's actually putting people's health and safety at risk. This Monday, a paediatrician, Dr Colin Mickey, spoke out about the increase in malnutrition-related hospital admissions in children aged under 16. The number of hospital admissions for malnutrition doubled between 2008 and 2012, and last year reached a seven-year high of 6,520 people in this country admitted to hospital because of malnutrition. The Faculty of Public Health, John Middleton, said food-related ill health was getting worse through extreme poverty and the use of food banks because people can't afford good quality food it's getting worse where malnutrition rickets and other manifestations of extreme poor diet are becoming apparent it's almost inconceivable that in this country in 2015 we're seeing the re return of victorian diseases the incidence of hospital admissions for scurvy have doubled since 2010 under this government would be, I just wonder if you could help us with a <coughs> definition of, of those types of food she means, because um, products like potatoes, fresh carrots, they're, they're actually the cheapest sources of food that, that are available. And, and you know, I, I think um, it would be helpful if she, she could sort of define the types of foods she means. No, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm, sure, I'm sure if he went down to a local food bank in his constituency and explained to his constituents that they should be buying carrots and potatoes, they would thank him for it in May. I mean, I just have to say to him that it's this sort of attitude towards people whose poverty is caused by this government that does his party so much harm and deservedly so. I'll say this to him, food prices have risen 12% in the last few years, wages have fallen by 7.6%. Those are the facts. That is why families do not have enough to feed and clothe their children. The British Red Cross is a charity that is more used to working in countries that are torn apart by war, famine and disaster. And yet, in this country, just a couple of years ago, because of the actions of this government, they had to launch an emergency appeal to feed and clothe our children. Mr Crosby, it was Nelson Mandela who said there can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than how it treats its children. And here we are, forcing parents to drag ill two-year-olds across town on buses, to grow up in cold, damp conditions without gas, electricity or enough to eat, admitting children to hospital because of hunger, schools, vicars, charities stepping in to help and finding themselves overwhelmed. If this is the measure of our soul as a country, Mr 
uh, Mr Crosby, what sort of society have we become under this government? And the truth is that it could be so different to this. And I tried to explain this to the Honourable Gentleman a moment ago, but I'll try again and perhaps he might understand it. We've got one of the most, the highest child poverty rates in Europe, second only to Ireland, because of factors like low pay. And that's before you do anything through the state about trying to tackle it. Once you make the sorts of decisions on tax and welfare that this government have, child poverty goes through the roof. The IFS shows that tax and benefits changes made by this coalition have hit the poor and families with young children hardest and reduced household in incomes by £1,127 a year. Professor John Hill from the LSE said it was true that the very rich with incomes over 100,000 had lost out more than the average, but when viewed as a proportion of their income, it was the poorest, those that can least afford it, who'd lost the most. It is the abject failure to tackle the root causes of these problems. Low pay, underemployment, insecure work. And then on top of that, to take tax and benefits decisions that hit the poor hardest, that is pushing more and more children into poverty. And I'll say this to the Minister, is that even those flagship measures that are held up usually by the Liberal Democrats, who I don't think are here today, to tackle poverty, like raising the personal tax allowance, do little for the lowest paid. Many of them don't pay tax anyway. It doesn't help them at all. Others keep just 15 pence in every extra pound because in-work benefits like housing benefit get withdrawn. And the Director of Child Poverty Action Group in Scotland said all the EU countries with much lower child poverty rates than us use income transfers for poverty prevention. If they can do so much better for their children, then so can we. The legacy this government is set to leave is of rising child poverty and budgets that have made the poor much poorer while actually making many wealthy people even wealthier still. And we used to know this as a country, Mr Crosby. In government, we got more lone parents back into work. Like many other countries, we used the tax and benefit system to give families a basic income. But under this government, real spending per child on early education, childcare and sure start fell by a quarter in just three years. And if the government doesn't want to use the tax and benefits system to tackle child poverty, they could tackle the root causes. They could learn from Denmark or Slovenia, countries where child poverty is already relatively low. So the state has to do less heavy lifting through the tax and welfare system. But it is typical of this government, Mr Crosby, that instead of seeking to deal with the causes, they attack the symptoms. They attack the people and not the problems. Uh, they, instead of tackling, ch tackling child poverty, they get tough on children in poverty. And not just children in poverty, but those who try to help them. The Trussell Trust, accused by the Work and Pension Secretary of publicity seeking and scaremongering, where they dared to tell the public how many people they were having to feed in 21st century Britain. The Lobbying Act, which gags charities and campaigners from speaking out, but does nothing at all to tackle the problems in the lobbying industry and in politics. Exactly. Special advisers threatening charities and the Justice Secretary taking to the Daily Mail that bastion of social justice to, to attack charities as left-wing single-issue groups and restricting their right to challenge this government in these appalling actions. It sums up exactly what this government is all about. If you've got a problem with unemployment, attack the unemployed. If you don't know what to do about immigration, attack immigrants. You know, Bobby Kennedy once said, there's another kind of violence, slower but just as deadly, destructive as the shot or the bomb in the night. This is the violence of institutions, indifference and inaction and slow decay. This is the violence that afflicts the poor, that poisons relations between men. This is a slow destruction of a child by hunger and schools without books and homes without heat in the winter. This will be the government's legacy, to try and loosen the bonds that bind us through indifference, inaction and slow decay. Five years ago they were talking about broken Britain. I used to think broken Britain was an analysis. Now, five years in, I've come to realise that actually it was a manifesto. This is the broken Britain that they talked about and they have created it. And I'll say this to the Minister, in the end it will not work. Because this started as just an attack on the poor but it's pulling more and more people into it and it's tearing apart communities. It was summed up for me 
by a woman of 60 who's never been in debt in her life. She got into her arrears after her daughter moved out and she was hit by the bedroom tax. She simply can't afford the extra rent, so she's trying to move. But because we don't have any one-bedroom property spare in my borough, she's got nowhere to move to. My local reverend, Denise Hayes, told me she has all her friends and community here. She's someone we need on the estate. She's a good example for others. People in work, people out of work, half of the children living in poverty today are from working households. This isn't just the poor anymore. Children, cancer patients, pensioners. But I'll tell the minister this, they should be worried because there are new bonds of solidarity forming, just as they did in the 1980s when this happened before. There are new bonds of solidarity forming in communities like mine as more and more people are affected and more and more will refuse to give in because they can see that this isn't just a, an attack on the poor, Mr Crosby, this is an attack on our basic decency as a society and they, like me, know that Britain can do so much better than this. I intend to call the front benches at 15, no later than 15.40. That gives us 25 minutes. So if members can keep their remarks to around six minutes, then I'll be able to, I'm sure I'll be able to call everyone. Mark Spencer. Thank you, uh, Mr. Corsby. And can I uh, pay tribute to the Honourable Lady for calling Charlie. this debate and also pay tribute to, her, to the passion with which she delivered her, uh, her speech. Um, but I think... What is interesting, in the 45 minutes that she took to deliver her speech, she didn't give us a single option of what a future Labour government might do to readdress some of these concerns. She didn't even look at how she might solve the challenges we, we face. And, and I think, um, you know, frankly, it seems, it seems fairly simplistic to me that the best way to solve an individual's uh, difficulties, financial difficulties, is to get them into work, is to give them a job and let them earn their own money uh, and let them go out there and provide for their own family. Because not only does that give them the cash to, to improve their own life, it gives them the self-esteem and it gives them the quality of life that they, frankly, they deserve. Uh, and we should do that as a government. And, and you get a double whammy, of course, because when you take... Uh, an individual uh, out of the welfare system and, and they, they succeed in the workplace, then of course you make the, the, the pie that is left, frankly there is more for other people that are genuinely in difficulty and need that support of the, of the welfare state. Uh, and so if you look at what the government is trying to do, what, what the government has done over the last four and a half years, 1.7 million more people into work to, to try and get people uh, out of the welfare system and, and into the workplace to, to improve their own lives. Uh, yeah, of course, I'll give my time to the gentleman. Thanks very much. It's all well and good saying that there's another 1.4 million, sorry, 1.7 million people in work. But what type of employment is this? Because, you know, if you have a look at some of the statistics that's been published, there's up to 1.4 million people on zero-hour contracts, which, in effect, is less than the benefits. I, and I think, um, I thank the gentleman for his, for his intervention. I mean, the, the zero-hours contract was not something that happened under this government. It, they were in existence before this government came to power, and, and his government did nothing about that when they were in power. Now, I have to say to you, I've met individuals in my constituency that have been offered a zero-hours contract, that took up that contract, went to work, uh, and it became very successful. They, they were then offered a full-time career. They then progressed through the management structure uh, and are now earning a substantial salary. So they can sometimes be a gateway to, uh, to a career. But I think what we've got to do as a government is find a way to create these gateways so that individuals can, can aspire through, through the system. And, uh, and one way of doing that, in, in one moment, one way of doing that is to create apprenticeships. Uh, two million apprenticeships have been created under this government. Now, that is a way of getting the next generation the skills they require in, in order to take a career job at the, in some point in the future. I'll give way to my honourable friend. Thank you. Dominic Raab. Around this issue of part-time working, 
he recognised the official statistics which show that 74% of new jobs created under this government have been full-time. And the Chartered Institute for Personnel and Development show that job satisfaction amongst those on zero-hours contracts is the same as any other employee. Uh, absolutely. I'm uh, grateful for that intervention, and I think uh, those statistics stand on, on their own. Uh, now, the, the second way to help those people, once they've uh, been successful in getting a job, is, of course, if they're uh, uh, in a career which is not of the highest pay, is to cut the taxes for those people at, at the bottom of that pay structure so that they pay no tax at all. And I think the government's been very successful in lifting those people completely out of the, the, out of the tax system. I'll just, um, uh, and of course, the other, the other points that she raised, of course, were the friction between wages and inflation. And, you know, it's fair to say, following the enormous crash that we saw under the previous government, uh, there, was, there were some severe challenges in terms of uh, how inflation was moving forward and the ability of the economy to recover. Now, we're, we're now in a position where, of course, inflation is below uh, the rate of increase of wages, so we've turned that corner and we're going in the right direction. I give way for the last time to the Honourable Lady. <coughs> if, if the Honourable Gentleman ex could explain uh, why it was that up to 2007, the party uh, that, that he represents had actually supported the Labour government's spending plans, and as I recall it, had never ever suggested that there were changes that should be made to avoid a recession. I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm grateful because, of course, now her, uh, her party is now supporting uh, our funding uh, uh, pledges. So uh, there's a sort of friction there between the things that uh, her colleagues say in, in terms of how they're going to reverse some of the changes we've made, but then they're saying, on the other hand, they're going to support our spending regime. So uh, it will be interesting to hear that from the front bench, how they're going to justify that. I'll just turn quickly to, uh, to food because, of course, uh, in, a, in another life, I was, uh, I was a farmer. I was involved in food production and we actually uh, um, are uh, businesses which are involved in the supply of, of food. And, and um, it, it, the OECD, interestingly, say that uh, the ability to afford food in, in 06, 07, 9.8% of people were in that position. Uh, by the time we got to 11, 12, it had fallen to 8.1%. So it shows actually that uh, we, we're, we're going in the direction that is the right way. And I think... Uh, uh, of course, there will always be, there will always be cases that you can bring forward where individuals have got themselves into very difficult circumstances and, frankly, where the system has gone wrong. Uh, and, you know, she raised several cases where the system has, has gone wrong. Uh, and I, I've had them in my own constituency office where clearly that the system has broken down and some of the decisions uh, that have been made have been incorrect. Now, as, a, as their Member of Parliament, it's my job to try and help them through that system and to, to solve uh, the, the, the ills that they find themselves in. And we've actually been successful on a number of occasions in helping those individuals in difficult circumstances work their way through the system and actually get to the, get to the right point. I, I won't give away any more because I'm, I'm conscious that uh, uh, other people want to speak. But what I would say is, is uh, when the Minister rises, I, I, I challenge you, what I want to see... From this, from this government as we, as we move forward. I want to see the government continue to reduce the deficit to make sure the economy continues to grow, that we generate more jobs and we help people out of poverty through employment. I want to see the government continue to cut taxes for those people at the lowest end so that we can raise more people out of tax altogether. I want to see the government create uh, more jobs and to back businesses, particularly small businesses uh, that are creating uh, real-life careers uh, for people. I want to see a, a continuation of the welfare cap so that we can control immigration uh, and that we can make sure that those people who are in work are better off and those people who, are, who take that decision to go into work and get a career uh, and are able to move forward uh, are aspiring out of the difficulty they find themselves in. And I want to see uh, better schools to make sure the next generation have the education, not only that uh, delivers them uh, a future, but makes them ready for the workplace, that makes them uh, able to take careers and to move forward. And it, it, you know, it is the only way to solve 
this problem is to give people the aspiration and the ability to aspire out of uh, uh, the difficulties they find themselves in. Thank you very much. Uh, we, we, we only have 60 minutes left for the front benches. We have four people wanting to speak, so that means four minutes apiece. Uh, if I could have your cooperation on that. Dr Whiteford. Thank you, Mr Crosby, and I'll try to adhere to the, those limits. Can I start by congratulating the Honourable Member for Wigan on securing today's debate and for putting forward such a powerful case of the impact of government policies on our own constituents. I have to say I'm a wee bit disappointed that we're so thin on the ground here uh, in terms of MPs. I know that many of the folk who live on very low incomes feel abandoned by politicians in the current context and I don't think today's turnout will do anything to dispel those impressions. Poverty, deprivation and exclusion take many forms, but living on low incomes for any length of time has long-term consequences, not just for individuals, but for a society as a whole. And this government's austerity measures have made things worse for folk who are already struggling. The cumulative impact of austerity in the six years to 2016 is estimated at around £6 billion in Scotland alone, three quarters of which has come from the pockets of women and has impacted disproportionately on families with children and those with disabilities and health problems. Indeed, one of the government's flagship austerity measures, the bedroom tax, has fallen disproportionately on low-income disabled people. In Scotland, 80% of the households affected were the home of a disabled person. I believe that proportion is slightly lower in the rest of the UK, but it's still around two-thirds of the people affected. In Scotland, we've mitigated the bedroom tax, but uh, we can only do that by diverting resources from other policy areas, and it remains on the statute book. Uh, the people affected by the bedroom tax are in many cases the same people who are facing reduced support uh, through the introduction of personal independence payments and the same people who face enormous barriers in accessing the labour market. So those cumulative impacts are important and I think are one of the key reasons behind the kinds of symptoms that we're seeing uh, in our communities now. However, the key point I want to make today is in relation to child poverty because there's an overwhelming wealth of evidence that children who grow up in poverty experience poorer long-term outcomes than their wealthier counterparts, not just in terms of their educational attainment and career prospects, they're also likely to experience poorer health throughout their lives and have significantly lower life expectancy. After housing costs, just over one in five adults in the UK is living in poverty, but the proportion of children living in relative poverty is 27%. That's a scandal in terms of missed opportunities, thwarted potential and long-term problems we're storing up. Child poverty was coming down in Scotland at twice the rate of the UK, but according to the Child Poverty Action Group, it's now projected to rise to 100,000 children by 2020, almost entirely due to the impact of this government's austerity measures on families. Huge cuts to tax credits, the freeze in child benefit have eroded family incomes, with parents in low paid work amongst those worst hit by the government's austerity programmes. I think it's critically important in this debate that we understand that the majority, the vast majority of children growing up in poverty have at least one parent in work. In work poverty is the scourge of low paid families. The reality is that a family where both parents are working full time in minimum wage jobs, paying an average private sector rent, will be a family living below the poverty line. For people in low paid jobs, work is simply not a route out of poverty anymore and a full time salary can fall very short of a decent income. I say this on the ground in my own constituency. Even though unemployment is only around 1%, there are large numbers of people in very low paid work and consequently pockets of real deprivation. In the last year or two, a number of food banks have sprung up run by church volunteers who've recognised the increasing need in the community, need that is clearly linked to benefit changes and rising living costs and which is affecting people in work as well as people who are not. I think it's really important that we remember that back in 2012 in Scotland there were only 14,000 people dependent on food banks and the vast majority of them were people with chronic alcohol and substance abuse problems. Uh, but now we have over 70,000 people, that's a 400% increase. Uh, so I pay tribute to the people in the churches who are picking up the slack in the social safety net. Uh, but you know, we, really, we really shouldn't be at this point in the 21st century. That's why tackling low pay needs to be a priority. In Scotland, the areas of the public sector that are devolved responsibilities are now all paying the living wage, but there are still many thousands of people in other economic sectors earning wages that don't cover the basics. Uh, many employers have become living wage employers, but there's still some way to go there. We shouldn't forget that many of the low-paid sectors are sectors still predominantly uh, where women work, whether that's cleaning, catering, food production. Uh, and the concentration of women in part-time, low-paid, often insecure work compounds other social and economic 
inequalities. I also uh, want very briefly to mention improved childcare because I think that's also very necessary to tackle child poverty and strengthen our economy. I've got no doubt that the higher levels of women participating in the labour market in Scotland and the falls in child poverty we witnessed were linked to the greater entitlement to childcare introduced over recent years. I hear from parents in all income groups that the problem of accessing affordable uh, childcare is the major barrier to the labour market and also the barrier within the labour market to women being able to do the jobs that they're qualified for. We've got a real economic problem with women uh, taking jobs that they can juggle their family lives around uh, and it holds back our whole economy and it holds back uh, people in our workforce. A little bit was said earlier in the debate about sanctions and one of the bits of evidence that has emerged in sanctioning so far is that uh, single parents in particular are being hit by sanctions and I think that's you know, it's the same challenge that people are facing in the workplace, that it's just extremely difficult to juggle uh, childcare with any other commitments if you don't have uh, somebody who can watch your kids for you when you attend to your other responsibilities. Mr Crosby, in a country as wealthy as ours, allowing children to grow up in poverty is a sheer abdication of our responsibilities as citizens. The kind of inequalities we've allowed to become acceptable have a long-term impact that leave us all impoverished. I think voters understand that asking those in the lowest incomes to carry the can for past economic failures is a cowardly choice and it's the wrong choice. This government badly needs to change its priorities. Sheila Gilmore, we're now down to three minutes. <laughs> Thank you, M Mr Crosby. I think across the, uh, across the House it is accepted that employment is a good thing, that jobs are a good thing, and that it does help people uh, improve their standard of living. But the problem is it's not sufficient. It is a first step. But what the last few years above all have shown us is that for very many people, it is only that preliminary step that still leaves very many of them living in poverty, which is why we are seeing so many people who are in work having to claim uh, housing benefit to meet their housing costs, pushing up the overall housing benefit bill, why so many people are indeed still dependent upon uh, some form of help when they go into employment. And the route out of that low-paid, low-hours economy is not as easy as it is sometimes suggested. So that's one aspect of where we are at the moment. Work Yes, it's good, but it has not proved to be sufficient to get people out of poverty. And uh, the last speaker mentioned the issues around single parents. And I think this is it's important to see that some of the things that were helping single parents have actually been removed. Uh, single parent specialist advisors in job centres who knew uh, the particular difficulties that women in that position, mainly women, it could be men, uh, face, have actually been reduced. There are very few such advisors. Other people have reported that the flexibilities which used to exist in terms of job seeking and job finding uh, have been removed, have been reduced, or people claim not to know about them. Um, and therefore, we have single parents being told, I, one of my constituents was, was simply asked, well, why can't your mother come? Uh, and uh, help. Well, her mother lived 300 miles away. She couldn't simply come and help while she made herself available for what the job centre wanted, which was an evening job. But the job parent flexibilities actually would have said that should not happen. So again, that's a change which appears to have happened in practice, which is making it difficult for that particular group. And yes, there are choices. There are always uh, financial choices to be made here. And constantly talking about raising the tax threshold is all very well. But three quarters of the gain from that went to earners in the top half of the income range. Um, so that is a lot of money which has been paid out in that direction and which apparently, uh, certainly the Conservative part of this government, I'm not sure uh, about the, the other part, wants to, uh, wants to do again to increase further without telling us at all how that is going to be funded. And the problem about that is that if it is going to be funded by things we don't know, but perhaps a bad increase, but pressed on this week after week, I notice that the Prime Minister doesn't say no, um, talk about no plans, but a bad increase would actually affect those who already earn under the, the, the tax threshold and who gain nothing from any further increases in that. And these are the people who've also lost tax credits, who've lost um, income in all sorts of ways. 
Some might seem quite small scale, but family household income has gone down. Um, people who have illnesses and uh, have, to, have to leave work due to illness, for example, you get a family, uh, a couple perhaps, maybe their children have grown up, they had two, two incomes, one and a half incomes. One loses their job through ill health, they immediately their income is slashed as they go on to benefit under rules introduced by this government. After a year, some of those are losing even their uh, employment and support allowance because they have a partner who is in work. That partner may only be working part-time. That loss of income from perhaps the one and a half earning family to barely half uh, a, a wage family is catastrophic for their well-being. And many of these people are moving towards uh, what they hoped had been a slightly more comfortable retirement. A lot of them often are older because that's when ill health strikes in people's late 40s and 50s. These are people who are now having to eat up, in effect, their savings that they'd hoped for for retirement. So there's a whole lot of different ways in which people are, in my view, being directly affected by this government's policies. Dominic Raab. Thank you, Mr. Corsby, and I will be as quick as I possibly can and, and try and stick to your, um, your, your limits here. I think the first thing I'd like to say is to welcome the debate, even though it was, I think, really um, uh, uh, the, the Honourable Member for Wigan um, made a number of political points to go with. Um, I, I, I will see it um, for, 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 the, for the end of it, but, but I'd, be happily to take a, uh, I'd be happily to take an intervention from her um, if, she'd, if she'd like to make a point of substance as we go along, but we are very pressed for time. The key point here is that, not, not at the moment, I said on a, on a point of substance, um, the key point here is the systemic challenges our economy faces, and the fact of the matter is that our economy sunk from 13th place to 4th place on the global competitiveness rankings and uh, has now climbed steadily but surely back up to 10th. And that is the reason why we have historic job creation at a record high. And if you really care not just about the economy but about the most socially disenfranchised, you've got to care about the unemployed, the most, the most vulnerable in our society. And the unemployment rate, I, I, do you know what, I, I, I'm not going to make some progress. She spoke for a considerable amount of time. Um, uh, she, she spoke for a considerable amount of time, and we're very pressed for time. Unemployment has, has fallen from 8% to 5.8%. Youth unemployment's down. And um, the overall, we've got 1.7 million more people in work. If you care about the most vulnerable in our society, that's the critical, um, I, I think, uh, section of society. I'll give way, briefly. So now I'm giving way, and I was simply... Uh, about to say to him that had he been here for my speech and not been 45 minutes late, he would have heard that for many of the families that whose stories I recounted for those who were present, they are actually in work or had been in work when those problems arose. And I would say to him that one of the stories that he missed was about one of my constituents who was sanctioned for three months for being four minutes late for an appointment. He was 45 minutes late for this debate and doesn't seem to have suffered any adverse repercussions at all. Uh, uh, I, I, I thank Order. you for giving way. I was following um, the debate, but um, unfortunately I was um, in another committee and I did give advance warning to this one. But the key point that, that she needs to address is the fact that, they're, they're, th th that all of the kind of policies that the Labour Party is coming up with will stifle jobs creation. And I just gently point out to her, I gently point out to her that in her own constituency, according to the House of Commons, unemployment um, doubled between 2005 and 10, but fell by 63% between 2010 and the present day. And I think that, frankly, that, those facts tell you everything you need to know. When it comes to income tax, when it comes to income tax, you might want to listen as well as speak, because this is a debate, and I listened very carefully to what she was saying. Um, Order. Order. The, the, the rate... Dominic Raab. The, the, if, you, if you're earning between 10 and 15,000 pounds under this government, you're paying 54% less tax than you were under the last government. If you're a millionaire, we get lots of jives on this side of the house about that, you're paying 14% more. When do we ever hear that referred to? A lot of people have talked about poverty. Actually, if you look at the inequality Gini coefficient, elderly poverty, fuel poverty, the number of neets, child poverty, on every single statistical benchmark, the, the, the level of poverty or inequality is lower now than what the last government left behind. Where's the little bit of honesty about that? When it comes to affordable homes, the average annual rate of creation of affordable homes is 50% 
higher under this government than the last government. She might have mentioned that in her speech. What about inflation, which eats away incomes? I won't, because I've got very limited time before we come to the wind-ups, and actually we've heard a huge amount from that side. I think it's important to hear the counter-arguments to puncture some of the myths that the Labour Party are putting around. In, in Mr Raab did give notice that he would be late. Now, if I'm going to call Mr Lavery, uh, you're going to have to give Mr Raab the opportunity to speak. Dominic Raab. Thank you, uh, Mr Corsby. I do, do appreciate it. Now, inflation is the other key indicator. It was 3.4% in May 2010. It's down to 0.5%. This isn't um, unalloyed good news. It's tough for savers. But actually, if you're dealing with cost of living issues, which um, I'm, I believe she cares strongly about, that actually is incredibly relevant. There is still much to do. But if you care about things like energy prices, um, you wouldn't be backing reckless interventions in the energy market that will just create spikes in retail prices. You'd be investing in nuclear. You'd, you'll be investing in shale. But was it five or six nuclear plants that were closed down under the last government? And they're going slow on fracking as well. Again, if you're serious about long-term issues dealing with poverty in this country, those are the things you'll be dealing with. If you care about food prices, well, we'd welcome the competitive super the, the, the supermarket uh, price wars that we've been seeing recently, um, and, and that's because of the free market. But you'd be concerned about the £400 that the common, uh, common agricultural policy puts on the average um, annual family food bill. When do we ever hear from any Labour MPs about that? You'd be looking for freer trade and reform of the EU. Uh, in conclusion, uh, uh, Mr. Corsby, um, I welcome this debate, but it's important to shed some light, not just some heat, on this very contentious issue which afflicts the most vulnerable in our society. And the fact is, she can nod her head, she can shake her head all she likes. The fact is, on almost every official indicator and on al almost every policy lever, this government has done better than the last government. Not only is the economy doing better, but life is fairer for the most people in terms of what government can reasonably control. Those are the facts, like them or not. I, I did say that I would call the front benches at 15.40. It's now turned that, but I'm going to give Ian Lavery one minute, and if he, over, if he goes past it, I will interrupt him. Ian Lavery. Thanks very much uh, for your extreme flexibility, uh, Mr Crosby. It, within one minute, I simply would say that we live in a different world here in, in Westminster. We live in a broken society in the rest of the country. We've got children suffering because of poverty. We've got disabled people suffering because of poverty and the introduction of the bedroom tax. We've got mentally ill people suffering greatly because of the situation faced in this country. We've got single parents single out because of the situation this government has imposed upon them. And of course, we've got old people suffering because of po uh, poverty in this country. Many of them are cuddling together because they cannot even afford to put electricity in the meter or food on the table. We live in a broken society. Poverty is preventable, Mr. Crosby. Poverty is a political choice. And it's a shame on this government and on politicians to allow poverty to continue the way we experienced it here in Food Bank Britain. We've got people in work who cannot put food Order. on the table. Helen Goodman. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr Crosby. And what a delight it is to see you in the chair this afternoon. I'd like to begin by congratulating my honourable friend, the member for Wigan, who made a passionate speech. She, she secured an important de debate and she described eloquently the impact of poverty on her constituents. Now, because she has given so many concrete stories about real people, I'm going to talk about the overview and the national picture instead. Although, she, I just want to remind the Minister, this is the second time in a month, she's been asked about sanctions. We asked her to do a number of things about sanctions in a debate we had in the North East to check what was going on. And when she winds up, I'd like to know whether she's done those things. In the last parliament, I was privileged to be the minister who took the Child Poverty Act through. And because of the complexity of measuring child poverty, we had four measures. A measure of relative poverty, a measure of absolute poverty, a measure of persistent poverty, and a measure of combined low income and material deprivation. This bill was passed with all party agreement, and everybody agreed that we wanted to make 
progress on all these fronts. What has been the record? Well, the record of the Labour government in bringing down the number of children in absolute poverty between 1997 and 2010 was a reduction of 1.8 million children. The record, according to the DWP's own statistics, I hope the Minister is listening to this, the statistics she published last summer is that the number of children living in absolute poverty in this country has gone up by half a million under this government. The next measure is the measure of relative poverty. Between 1997 and 2010, the number of children living in relative poverty fell by 1.3 million. The measure of relative of the number of children who live in relative poverty between 2009 and 2013 had at that point fallen by 200,000. Although I have to tell members that the IFS are forecasting an increase by the May election of 400,000. What ministers, what members opposite need to ask themselves is why has the absolute poverty increased? and the relative poverty reduced. What is going on here? This is the important question that, minister, that members need to understand, and ministers. The reason is this. The median income in this country has dropped by 8% under this government, whereas the poorest decile, their income, has dropped by 5%. So everybody is poorer. It's just that the people at the bottom are not quite as much poorer as the people in the middle. And he can shake his head. Those are the figures that this government, this government published only in July. And they should think about it. And the... the Vic. The response PPSs should be seen and not heard. Helen Goodman. The response we have had from ministers and from Tory members today is precisely what is described by the Archbishop of Canterbury in this new book on rock or sand as willful blindness. If you are willfully blind to the real problems that are going on in this country, you will not be able to deal with them. That is the major problem that we have. And this government is responsible for a large number of the measures which have pushed the poorest further down. So, what are we going to do instead? Uh, the, my honourable friend, the member for Edinburgh, pointed out that in-work poverty is now exploding as well. And this is a point also made in this excellent book, which I can recommend to all honourable members, by Julia Unwin. This is the new feature of poverty. This is in-work poverty. This in-work poverty is caused by rising prices, a cost of living crisis, and falling yeah. incomes. And this government is going to continue with this exploitative path, which in fact is going to increase the benefits bill, as my colleague, the member for Leeds West, pointed out this morning, by nine billion pounds. Yet, the Secretary of State this morning was bragging about the thing which Bernardo's have complained to me about, the taking of 50 billion pounds from the children of this country in the period of this parliament. So, honourable members said, what would Labour do? And I will tell them what Labour will do. The first thing Labour will do is abolish the bedroom tax. If the Tories are re paid for by taxing the hedge funds, as was discussed in PMQs only this lunchtime, when the Prime Minister refused, refused to tax the hedge funds. That is how we will pay for it. This bill of 3,000, this bill of 3,800 pounds, this, this bill of 3,800 pounds in the bedroom tax over the next parliament will be visited on the poorest people. Two thirds of those paying the bedroom tax are disabled. 
if a Tory-led government is re-elected, these people will face another £3,800. That is why the first thing a Labour government will do if we are elected is abolish it. We will also increase the minimum wage. We will also tackle zero-hours culture. We will also tax the bankers' bonuses in order to get young people into work. We will also sort out the energy market. We will also do something about rents. We will also take steps to improve childcare so that lone mums and other mums can get out to work and support their families. And we will build more houses, which in itself will help to bring down housing costs and provide more jobs. It's a comprehensive picture. It's a real choice for the British people. Minister, Esther McVeigh. Thank you, Mr Crosby, and it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship uh, today. And I do think it's uh, an incredibly important debate that has been brought uh, to, the, uh, to the chamber today. And I want to thank the uh, Honourable Lady for Wigan for doing that. Um, but I would like to begin by putting what I've heard today in context, because every story that was brought uh, to, to hear is important, and it's important that we listen to them. But equally, let's look at the inequality figures, the independent figures that are happening. Income inequality is lower now than it was at the election. There are 600,000 fewer people in relative poverty than at the election. Why do I use relative poverty? Because I know there are various measures. Because it was Labour's preferred measure to which they set their targets against, to which they said that they would halve it by 2010 and missed it. You've had your opportunity to speak. Let's listen to others who want to speak. Esther McVeigh. There are also 300,000 fewer children living in relative poverty. And equally, the top 1% of income payers, I, I won't give way for a while because I would like to, to put these figures down. The top 1% of income taxpayers will contribute nearly 30% of the income tax bill this year. So when we talk about the richest helping the most to get us out of the financial situation that we actually found ourselves in after Labour left office. That is what's happening. And also the top 20% are actually paying 80% of the bill. That is, that is key there. We've also got 390,000 fewer children uh, living in workless households. And in-work poverty has fallen by 300,000. In fact, in-work poverty rose 20% between 1998 and 2008. I won't for the moment. And it's key to also know that 1.75 million people, more people, are in work. So when the honourable friend, my honourable friend for Isha and Walton talked about what sort of jobs are these, he was quite right in saying from the election three quarters of full-time jobs. In fact, in the last year, 80% are full-time jobs. And what sort of jobs are they? The vast majority, 75%, are skilled, managerial and professional. Now, if we want to look at these figures from the other point, we could say at the election there were 600,000 more people in relative poverty. Six 670,000 more workless households. We could say there were 300,000 more children in relative poverty. We could say there were 200,000 more pensioners in relative poverty. We could also say there were 50,000 more households where no member had ever worked. That was what we were picking up. And as the honourable friend for Daventry uh, points out, which I, I hope it's a point of consensus for all of us, that actually there had been a financial crash the economy, the GDP of the whole of the country had shrunk by 7%. And the truth of the matter is, everybody had to uh, bear the brunt of that crash that we had from the Labour Party opposite. But what we have Order. made sure... Please allow the Minister to respond. Minister. And so what we have done is ensured that the richest are paying the most. We are ensuring that the richest people are actually paying more now than they ever paid under Labour. And when the lady, the right, you know, the honourable lady for Wigan talks about working for Bernardo's, I congratulate her for that because I am a child of Bernardo's. So when we talk about poverty and how we take people out of poverty, the key things and the key building blocks of that have to be 
education and they have to be employment, which is the key building blocks that this government is doing. And so when we look at this, what have we done there? Increasing, and we've got record rates of women into work. We're increasing and supporting lone parents into work. We have put £2.5 billion into the Troubled Families Initiative. We have put the same amount into the pupil premium. We have made sure that 3 million people are out of tax altogether. The 26 million have got reduced tax. We are making sure that we have increased the minimum wage to £6.50, the first real increase since 2008, a 3% increase there, uh, and benefits over 1 million people in that. The national minimum wages, if they are on that and full-time, they are getting an extra £355 a year from that. All of these things uh, are key, and all of those are the key things that we are doing. I will indeed give way. If the Minister would like to comment then on uh, her point that she made around inequalities actually reducing on the OECD's report before Christmas, on the IMF's report uh, at a similar time as well, showing that inequality actually had increased, in fact it's the worst in 30 years, and that inequality was harming growth, that trickle-down economics that this, uh, this government uh, is uh, absolutely committed to doesn't work. It actually stifles growth. Exactly. Yeah. As always, I, I never recognise where the Honourable Lady gets her, her figures from. The facts I have given, and given the independent ones, are the uh, correct uh, ones. The only thing I will say, here was a party that delivered us the biggest crash, biggest financial crash in living memory. This is the party who said there'll be a million more people unemployed now, and actually we're near to two million more people employed. I think they'd be better to listen for a change rather than charging forward with, with um, things that really aren't true. It's sometimes worth listening rather than actually talking, especially when the Labour Party delivered such a disaster for the UK that we are all now having to cope and deal with and find ways to move out. And it is also worth remembering, because of our long-term economic plan, that actually we are the fastest growing country now in the developed nation. We have delivered more jobs in the UK than the rest of Europe added together. These things are fact. So, turning to the Honourable Lady's constituency, for Wigan uh, in particular, uh, we had the facts read out from uh, my honourable friend for Isha there, who talked about uh, the unemployment figures, the claim and count there had risen 100% from 2005 to 2010. Yeah. But let's look what's happening in Wigan now. The unemployment rate is, sorry, the employment rate is up by 7.9 percentage points. The claim and count is down by 49 percentage points. Long term <laughs> claim and count is down by 44 percent. Youth claim and count is down by 70 percent. And long term youth claim and count. Order. The minister must be allowed to respond. Minister. And the long-term youth claim and count is down 80% on the year. In fact, youth unemployment across the country has had its biggest fall in living memory. It's now 107, over 170,000 people more now in, 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 in jobs for young people than, than before. These just are the facts. And for the North West as a region, the number of workless households are down 41,000 since 2010. That's a decrease of 1.7 percentage points. And last week in the local paper, the Wigan local paper, the number of apprenticeship vacancies in Wigan has now actually hit a record high. There has been a 72% increase in apprenticeships vacancies in Wigan posted uh, online. And the paper said an upsurge in firms willing to take on an apprentice has really been credited with helping the dramatic fall in youth unemployment. I will indeed. Lisa that one of the reasons that we've managed to get young people into apprenticeships is because the council has taken exactly the opposite approach to this government. It pays the living wage, it's stamped out zero-hours contracts, and it's created apprenticeships. Can she tell me if everything is going so well across this country, why she thinks that the incidence of scurvy and the number of hospital admissions for malnutrition have exploded under her government? Minister. Uh, well, first of all, these were from private enterprises, the numbers that I've given. 
Equally, like I said, I don't really know. I don't really know what the answer was when the honourable lady stood up to actually explain why there had been a hundred percent increase in the claimant count between 2005-10, but actually ours had come down. And as for which, I think is a debate for another time. The issues with why uh, malnutrition has actually increased. When I go to the, I think it is because actually there is a lot of people who actually have gone to hospital who've actually uh, are, have put on weight and they've got malnutrition and that is down to a poor diet and a bad diet and that is a much much bigger debate uh, for another time but what we can talk about is what is happening how we are getting people into work how we are having uh, worklessness falling in the honourable lady's constituency obviously she doesn't want to listen to these answers now because obviously it just doesn't really play to the the things that she was talking about equally in the paper in her own local paper they were celebrating the fact that they'd had the pupil premium award the headmaster said we couldn't be more pleased to win this award because it really is key in helping young people uh, go uh, forward. And when I did listen to um, the stories that the Honourable Lady brought forward about uh, sanctions and what had happened there, I'd like to have those specific in instances because when I, I have replied to a letter, I think it was only the other week, and I hear you've sent me another one and I will be writing to that in due course, but if you could actually give me the people rather than them remaining um, anonymous, then I could find out what happened has happened, what did happen at the job centre, because if somebody would want to go to a funeral, that would actually be good cause. When somebody has got learning difficulties, they would be a vulnerable person, they would have good cause, and there is a booklet which the uh, Honourable Lady can download from the website, looking at that guidance, which is substantial, it is a heavy document, that says how people would be uh, given good cause. I, I wouldn't do that. And equally, when we talk, um, again, uh, uh, about sanctions, sanctions have always been there in the benefit system. Since it began, this is nothing new that has Order. been introduced. Order.